A very fair criticism leveled against SETI that's often mentioned is that we are functioning on a very big, very glaring bias. And it may be so huge that it solves the Fermi paradox in one fell swoop. It's simply that advanced aliens may not use radio in favor of some other form of long distance communication that is drastically superior to it. Fair game. But it also has to be noted that if aliens are common in the universe, then the window in which they use radio must be very small, as we should still be detecting civilizations that haven't yet progressed to unknown advanced means of communication. The other issue is God of the Gaps, or in this case, Aliens of the Gaps. Alien civilizations, until we actually see one and can study it in a meaningful way, can simply do anything. They're a catch-all. That star is acting weird. Aliens did it. That galaxy cluster is weird. Aliens did it. Mars is a big desert. Aliens did it. And so on. That of course doesn't account for the reality that most of what goes on in the universe that we see is of natural origin, even if that origin is unclear at first. With aliens, however, once we see them, unambiguously, well, it's never aliens until it is. Radio offers a good way to find the until it is part, in that you can make a radio signal unambiguous. And we do this routinely, not to get alien attention, but because it saves energy and expense. Nature doesn't care about that. And it simply would not make narrowband signals, except in a few distinct instances. Everything else smears across the dial, either through broadband transmission or red or blue shifting. See one that doesn't fit that pattern, such as the WOW signal, pick it up more than once and verify it, and it's aliens. Radio is a very good way of searching, because you can prove it. Not a lot of other ways that we know of can get us there. A few out of place atmospheric gases, some visual markers, and a few other things can also do it, but there's also a ton of ambiguous potential techno signatures that are going to be very difficult to separate from natural processes. As to communications as we do not know them, well, ultimately you have to start somewhere. You can't look for what you don't know how to look for, and radio, we know how to look for. But there's a greater issue here beyond technology. It's a bias in how we look for life itself. All we have to go on is Earth life and its chemistry. And on the microbial scale, even microbial life is hard to look for, leading to questions about shadow biospheres, where there could be an entire regime of microbial life, a second day biogenesis of life on Earth, operating here that we just aren't using the equipment we'd need to look for it. How do you look for something when you don't know what it looks like? But even then, we make assumptions, such as that a second abiogenesis would be a recognizable form of biology operating in a recognizable place. Alternative microbes operating in an Earth-like environment. But unlike the unknown communications technology, here it's a bit easier to speculate about, as to whether radically different forms of simple life could exist. And there are a group of intriguing ideas to contemplate how life as we do not know it might exist in the universe. One is molten lava. The idea here is that the chemistry of life on Earth happens in a solvent, water. There are other liquids in the universe, such as ammonia, sulfuric acid, and mixes such as ammonia and water where this might occur. And also other solvents, but many of those are simply rare and not likely to occur anywhere in concentrations that seem likely to harbor life. And some liquids are just not likely at all to be able to do anything on a chemical basis, as far as life goes, such as mercury. But lava is a little different. Yes, it's obviously extremely hot, and the chemistry of carbon that gives rise to life on Earth under no circumstance can function at those temperatures. Even the most extreme of heat extremophiles can't do it. But what of life that only exists at very hot temperatures that's not based on carbon, but silicon? Silicon-based life in general is one of the stronger forms of alternative biochemistry out there, in that silicon can form a lot of chemical bonds, though not as many as carbon, and it's enough to carry biological information unlike most atoms. It doesn't have the extreme possibilities of carbon, but it can at least be contemplated. Lava is largely silicon, so the question has to be asked. Could silicon-based life arise and persist in a lava lake? There are a few problems here. First, you probably need the lava to persist long term. Planets can maintain molten surfaces, oceans of lava, for a very long time but not forever. They cool. As they cool, volcanic activity gets very transient. 
going from periods of eruption to periods of dormancy, and the path volcanism takes changes. One eruption may come from one part of a mountain, and then something happens geologically in the same magma chamber may outflow from a different fissure kilometers away. So you'd need very special circumstances or a situation that keeps lava going very long term, a persistent pool of lava of some sort unless the chemistry of abiogenesis and silicon life happens extremely rapidly. Then it goes extinct the moment the lava solidifies. Then there are the temperatures involved. This would create a very different environment for silicon chemistry to occur in, and it's just not well fleshed out as to what really could happen under such extremes, if anything. There are some suggestions of reactions of oxygen and aluminum, but if it did happen, how would you recognize it, even if you were searching for it? Lava cools and may preserve no such record of whatever was happening inside it that you could separate out as anything but geology. In short, this form of silicon-based life may be inherently undetectable, which will be a common theme for this topic. It's not that far from the problem with SETI. How do you look for it? But there is another option for silicon that might work, and that's organosilicon life. Here we have some interesting clues. Life does manipulate silicon on Earth to some degree. But what doesn't happen is a true organosilicon molecule in life. But some experimental work has shown that life can be artificially goaded into it. And if humans can do it, usually nature can as well. And maybe some fusion of the chemistry of carbon and silicon occurs in extraterrestrial life. So far we've touched on normal chemical paths that might be useful to life. There are quite a few more regarding alternative solvents and chemical reactions, but those all suffer from the problem of being relatively rare in the universe. But there have been some more interesting ideas that actually go beyond what we can imagine in chemistry. The next is neutron star life. This one actually originates with Frank Drake and was expanded upon in science fiction by Robert Forward in Dragon's Egg and Starquake. Drake speculated that life could actually have a path on the strange surface of a neutron star, probably easier than it could on an actual main sequence star. Think of submicroscopic life, very tiny, made of packed nuclei arranged as nuclear molecules, very different from normal chemistry due to the extreme gravity. Nuclear reactions happen much faster, so if life came out of this, then it would live in fast forward, probably lifespans of microseconds to the tune of a million times faster than what life on Earth experiences. As highly speculative as that is, there's worse, and here it comes. We really have no idea what the rules on dark matter are, if it actually exists. We just know that it's exerting gravity, and it doesn't like to react in any other way. Some say that we may come up with a theory that eliminates dark matter, such as modified Newtonian dynamics or something else, and that might end up true. But so far it really looks like there's matter in the universe that we can't see. Or can't readily see because we don't know how to look for it. Same problem as SETI. But this is actually a good bet for dark matter because we already know that there are particles that do this. The neutrino can be seen as a type of dark matter. How far that extends we have no idea. But it has been suggested that there may be a huge amount of complexity in dark matter. Even to the point of there being a dark periodic table. It can't even be speculated about what that might look like, if it looks anything like our own periodic table or if it's vastly different. And dark matter ends up even more complex than normal matter in chemistry. Or if it's vastly different and dark matter ends up even more complex than normal matter in chemistry. Well, what could dark chemistry be capable of? No one knows, but you could play with the idea, and remember I'm a science fiction author, not a scientist, my job is to speculate that maybe, just maybe, the dark periodic table has options for life. I played with this idea in my first book, The Salvagers, where people could be manipulated by dark matter aliens in subtle ways. But fundamentally, I left it open as to just how, because in reality, the only dark matter interaction we really know about is gravity. Maybe there are others we don't know about. But in the end, this form of life would be exceedingly difficult to study because of the non-interactivity. And it's actually possible that no civilization from us to aliens in the entire universe has an answer to this question. The last one is even further out there. Can the universe itself somehow be alive? 
One of the weird aspects of the universe is that it's not uniform. Galaxies organize into clusters and filaments in between voids. In some sense, this actually loosely looks a little bit like a human brain or neural network and how those are organized. Neurons also form clusters, but not through gravity. There are differences, however, the most obvious being that the universe is expanding and brains currently do not. This would mean that if it were something like a neural network, it's going to think slower and slower as it ages. And as of right now, if there is any connection between galaxies acting as neurons of sorts, it's very, very slow. This would suggest that the universe does not have this capability and that it's unthinking. And that's the view of most scientists, even though the idea is interesting. But that's where I sit as well. But inside this is an interesting possibility, locality. We know that the universe of the big is local. Stars stay within the rules of their motion and don't just teleport somewhere else. But in the quantum world, this actually happens and means that while quantum non-locality is random to us, such as spooky action at a distance, it may not be so to some upper framework of the universe, in which case it wouldn't matter how big it got. It would always think the same instantaneous speed, no matter how much it physically expanded. This could actually go even smaller, smaller than subatomic particles can even operate. So the extent of non-locality is not known nor is the effect of other dimensions. We don't even know if those exist. So this one is full of what ifs and sits in the realm of things like simulation theory, on the fringes of physics, but not outside the realm of possibility. And that brings back dark matter. It may be that dark matter isn't what we think it is. Rather, non-locality manifests in our relativistic level in that gravitational attraction gets multiplied over spread out areas because they are non-locally connected and it's really just normal matter behaving in an unfamiliar way. Again though, to prove that, you have to come up with some idea of what you're looking for. Thanks for listening, I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently concerned about a thinking universe. I wonder what it's thinking, and I really wonder what it thinks about us. Not good, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations of the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we think.